thank you. I want to thank uh, Professor Annette Kim it's and, and USC Price. It's a particular pleasure to, do, to be asked by Annette because the first time we met, or some, sometime soon after we met, I took her housing and land use course at MIT. And this is, you know, housing and land use, every planning department has that. But she actually encouraged all her students to take on innovative methods, including critical mapping, in order to understand the social and spatial urban issues that planners are all, all concerned about. And it was, I think, an introduction to thinking about how planning and research can be different and can look to methods and theories from outside core social science planning concerns. And also, it's a pleasure to visit USC Price as someone who mostly spends my professional academic life on the other side of the city. It's nice to be here. Um, so thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. So I take the opportunity of this talk to think through some present and long-standing concerns of mine. So the first is about climate change, what to do about it, and how to think about it. This was reinforced to me last year at a faculty workshop at UCLA where my colleague Anania Roy made a point, which I'll paraphrase in this manner. So if climate change changes so much, then why are the ways in which urban researchers look at and analyze climate change in cities based so much on the same concepts and understandings of cities that we've had for so long. How can that be? And the second, and this builds on what Annette was saying in her introduction, is what might be termed an exuberance gap between my two fields. So between, on the one hand, the enthusiastic and almost giddy images of urban designers and architects for a kind of urban environmental future, and the clear-eyed alarm and sometimes despondency felt in critical studies and urban planning. So first, some context. In my previous research, I investigated the urban spatial politics of climate change adaptation. Exploring what I called a political ecology of design, I looked at plans and projects proposed by cities facing environmental threats such as the Rebuild by Design initiative in New York City after Hurricane Sandy, and the giant seawall master plan in Jakarta, and ask why these cities think that these are the best ways to respond to the problems. I trace the flows of ideas and influence between those sites and plans to various sites across the Netherlands, where climate change and economic change both have shifted the way that Dutch national and municipal governments conduct spatial planning and water management work. And I explored what I call the counter plans, these alternate ideas about environmental responses, including community resiliency initiatives in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and grassroots design activism in the informal kampongs of Jakarta. Looking at distinct sites and the local and global relationships among them, explanations about what was going on extended beyond the sites and projects in question. And I want to highlight two observations from this work that I think are particularly helpful to contextualize today's talk. So the first, climate change response strategies in seemingly disparate cities are highly interconnected across space and time with economic and cultural historical relationships as well as specific disaster events driving the formation of urban governance networks and the motivation behind urban uh, environmental projects. So in this work, I, I explained how a water square in Rotterdam that serves both as a recreational space and as well uh, stormwater uh, infrastructure, and an initiative like, like Room for the River here, which moves a dike to allow for selective, selected occasional flooding, 
It's connected to a longer history of Dutch water projects, such as the Delta Works, the ideas of which are now mobilized around the world through public and private agencies and organizations, international events, and through global and urban networks. So I showed how we might tease apart these relationships to understand better the organizations involved and as well the histories, events, and interfaces among them. I'm not going to dwell on these too much for now. Observation two. So urban ecological problems such as flooding in cities are due to interrelated spatial, biophysical, and sociopolitical factors across an urban region. Different worldviews of urban ecologies define how we think and act on these problems. So here I explain how flooding in, in the city can be traced to conflicts involving the biophysical and social changes across an urban regional watershed where development fights in the furthest reaches of the watershed far outside the, the city proper can impact the flows of water and associated social and political struggles all the way down to the city itself where you see these conflicts play out in particularly same, same point of view three years apart, four years apart. These conflicts play out in particularly concrete and uh, harmful ways down to the bay itself. And I showed how a shifting viewpoint inspired by the work of landscape architects rejecting, uh, in this case, a hard division between land and water, dry and wet, can, can, can show us how urban ecological conditions are part of broader global processes and local social conflicts. I'll return to some of this in the discussion to come. So in this research, the issue is not really about what was the best plan for the problems. Rather, it was about contests and claims over urban futures. What kind of city, who belongs there, and who gets a say in its future? So, such a question about the future city is particularly important for those of us who study the urban and take part in making it. So climate change, I'm just going to keep on, this goes on for a while. Climate change challenges to urban centers are now evident, increasingly well understood, and increasingly alarming. And cities have responded. From resiliency competitions to climate action plans, they have proposed ambitious spatial plans to adapt to and protect against climate change impacts and achieve broader urban sustainability. And these include soft and hard in environmental infrastructures and urban and landscape strategies to live with water, water and nature. And so these imaginaries, the visualizations of which are produced by architects, landscape architects, urban designers, present an idealized society living smoothly through the transition of climate change with prosperity, recreation, and urban nature on the other side. They are backed by institutional infrastructures comprising development agencies, global philanthropies, and transnational networks, often in a context of liberalized urban governance. So beyond the technocratic solutionism of modernist planning that we do talk a lot about, these efforts harness the power of design to mobilize ideas and expertise around the selective production of urban desires. They invoke the power of imagination to make us believe that this is what we want. How do we understand the role and implications of these kinds of green imaginaries? For me, a set of intertwined issues emerge. And the first is on the nature of design. The iterative and projective nature of design present a key challenge, I think, to the modes of knowledge of the social sciences where many of us research. The second concerns the nature of the visions themselves. So why are these the urban futures that we think that we want, and why do we think we can get there from here? Design, who in the room studies 
or is studies design or is a designer? It's like three, four. <laughs> so, hmm, okay. So, <laughs> so I'll tell you about design. Uh, design. <laughs> Design occupies an odd place in scholarship and practice, so simultaneously invoked as process, practice, and outcome, it trades on both an internal, often esoteric system of terminology and protocols, and an external technocratic system of production. Assumptions abound about what it is we really study when we say that we study design. When it comes to the professions involved in making urban spaces, design is disciplinarily positioned between planning architecture and landscape architecture. From a more epistemological perspective, design bounces between social science research and the practical concerns uh, and stakes of the various design fields. So design's object of research, just to take social science research seriously, is often quite elusive. It is at once empirical and projective. And here, I take urban design to be the whole thing, the system, the entwined imaginaries and practices of actively imagining and intervening in urban social and spatial change. So to me, one might talk about three levels of design. In its most um, concrete, number one, it is about the specific urban, spatial, and physical places at multiple spatial scales. Okay. Second, a level up in abstraction, it is about the social practices that form how such spatial, physical places are used and given meaning to. Third, even more abstractly, is about the projected ideas about the future of such places as a proposed solution, and as well as set of ideas about what constitutes desired or preferred futures. So that is, designing the <coughs> urban necessarily intertwines physical space, social meaning, and contested visions across levels of abstract abstraction. And to, uh, to better understand this kind of situation, I, I think about two uh, particular theoretical frameworks. So one is Henri Lefebvre's ideas about the production of space. Lefebvre's conceptual triad, space as conceived, perceived, and lived, explains how space, contests over space, and ideas about space can be at once material, you can see and, and touch it, political, subject to contestations and conflicts based on power relationships, and imagine, re-envision based on desires and ideals. You don't have to read that, really. The second is the generalized concept of urban social and ecological change developed by scholars of urban political ecology. I think mostly if you're interested, you can find out more. So these scholars extend ideas about environmental justice, which is classically descriptive and practice-based, and develop a framework of socio-environmental futures that is explicitly political and based on theories of urban political economy. So this framework links empirical observation to abstract concepts and to concrete change. Further, the process of design is iterative. I'll, again, tell you a bit about design. So in the classic spatial formulation, design evolves and revolves around particular desires and needs, concrete programs, modes of funding and project delivery, and design protocols such as the making of design documents, drawings and models, and the like. Uh, often with multiple options and often across multiple iterations. The broad objective is that over time, uh, you have a kind of emerging consensus be behind the desires and the constraints. But these constraints are not pre-given or unchanging, nor are they produced through any kind of really certain process. 
And the designers working on these things also frequently have their own ideas. They have their own formal, programmatic, and ideological objectives of their own that are quite separate from the concrete constraints that they may have been given. So these iteratives, iterative and not non <coughs> Nonlinear processes are in, very, are in some ways similar to the processes of other creative fields. But unlike those processes, like the, the artistic process of like a lone genius or a collective uh, design community, uh, collective art community, the processes of design reverberate between the dynamic aspects of changeable but assumed given concrete constraints embedded within a broader institutional and political eco economic context and continually constructed and reconstructed among a set of constituents. Okay, so in summary, the process of design is something that is iteratively developed, responding to both concrete changes in elements such as program and cost and as well responding to constructed and reconstructed desires and affinities. And the manipulations of more or less concrete terms are certainly not neutral. So the implication is that, and I will emphasize this point, for urban design research, the specific object of analysis, which I would call the design strategy, is iterative and relational in and of itself. So to illustrate how such a theoretical framework might uh, be used to assess design as we see it, I used two examples that I, that I showed earlier. So the first is the NCICD Giant Seawall Master Plan in Jakarta. And the second is the Big U proposal, part of the Re Rebuild by Design Initiative in New York City. And these, both these examples might be considered critical cases they are high-profile projects in their respective cities, each designed to take on some of the key challenges faced by those cities today. Jakarta, the capital city of Indonesia, floods chronically. The urban region, low-lying, traversed by 13 rivers, has faced severe floods basically about every five years. And in recent years, engineers, hydrologists, and designers have proposed various efforts to address the flooding. <coughs> These include infrastructural projects to dredge and widen the rivers and canals. And uh, also, the most ambitious to come out of this, uh, the, NC the National Capital Integrated <coughs> Coastal Development, NCICD Master Plan, known colloquially as the Giant Seawall. It is itself a new city for one and a half million people on reclaimed land in the Jakarta Bay. States the master plan, quote, the Garuda, it's called the, I'll tell you why it's called the Garuda. The Garuda will protect the city and will bring safety and prosperity to the national capital. It will offer Greater Jakarta a new image, clearly visible and recognizable from the sky, end quote. In physical and operational terms, the wings of the new development right here uh, arch across the bay and enclose uh, these massive retention lakes behind them that can be pumped low enough so that the canals and rivers from the, the existing city can drain into them. So it's basically like a big bathtub or sink that can be drained so that the city itself is higher than the, the pools of water. And this plan, designed by Dutch landscape architects and uh, urban designers, is shaped like the great Garuda, this eagle shape, uh, which is a mythical symbol of a uh, Javanese mythical symbol of Indonesia. The designer talks about literally demolishing the hotel room making these sketches. It's like architect as rock star. <laughs> but not, not just that. Aware of the, the errors, the, the mistakes of past modernist plans, the designer em emphasizes how his plan is different. 
the Garuda form is a deliberate invitation for the plan to be embraced as Indonesian. According to a Dutch hydrologist, the design turned what might have been a Dutch development aid project into an Indonesian national ambition. But those discourses neglect the plight of residents in living in the informal kampung settlements under threat of eviction and demolition uh, from the dredging projects that are meant to ease the flow of water. And it also ignores the efforts of activists and community groups in the kampongs to organize against this displacement. Working with community architects and researchers, these groups have produced counter plans against business as usual eviction, how to widen the river selectively and rebuild parts of the kampong, the informal settlement, to remain in place. According to an activist, their planning and design process, creating concrete documents about their vision of the city, legitimized Kampong residents and enabled them to negotiate with the city. Strident protests and political transitions since 2013, when I was first there, have forced substantial changes to the giant seawall plan. And the current vision no longer includes that giant Garuda uh, form. Uh, the current governor of Jakarta actually ran his election campaign on stopping reclamations and in effect halting that giant symbolic plan. Um, and there are new efforts to engage kampong communities in some urban development projects. Okay, shifting. The Presidential Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force launched the Rebuild by Design competition in 2013. The competition was charged with finding, quote, innovative, implementable proposals that promote resilience in the Sandy affected region, end quote. And uh, perhaps the most high profile of these projects <coughs> is the Big U proposal for Lower Manhattan by a team led by the architecture firm Big. So the Big U uh, proposes a series of landscape berms and building structures along the southern tip of Manhattan Island, combining hard and soft elements for a variety of recreational, cultural, and commercial purposes. Led by Henk Ovink, former, formerly Netherlands Director General of Spatial Planning and Water Affairs, and involving several Dutch designers and engineers, and managed by this woman, Amy Chester, whose previous experience was in urban policy and community engagement. Rebuild by Design attempted to bridge cultures and to merge competition, it was a competition, with collaboration. It explicitly required design teams to garner community stakeholder support. The Big U project took this up quite literally. Uh, explicitly hybridizing Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs, which, which in, in classic New York urban development narrative is the devil and angel, respectively. Uh, setting aside the fact that both Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs' ideas about the city work really well in privatized urban development in New York City nowadays, the big use uh, deliberately participatory process actually assuaged some of the, the, the community uh, stakeholders that they were working with. They actually thought, yeah, you know, you're paying some attention to us. Rebuild by Design was envisioned as a regional scale planning and design effort for the entire region, but federal funding and local implementation systems that didn't quite align and some of the processes for engagement itself actually made uh, implementing it impossible to be a regional project. And so the projects remain ambitious, but as it goes into the implementation phase, um, they tend to devolve, maybe not the, pro the proper word, devolve into a set of locally implementable propositions to protect against, hopefully, another sandy scale type, sandy scale event. Um, and in, and in, 
in addition, even though they did take on this community engagement process, it didn't translate to larger political change. And so in the case of the Big U, community ag activists first expressed support for the plan, uh, but conflict appeared, uh, appeared not, too, not too long after, with some community groups saying that the failing of the plan again ignored them, again ignored the lowest, uh, lowest income groups living in public housing along the, the Lower East Side. So in this case, uh, the plan makes visible idealized community futures and desired processes of participation while masking over some of the un underlying power structures and dominant processes of urban development that continue in, in New York today. Uh, many of these projects are now caught in various local public procurement processes. Recently, uh, Mayor de Blasio, who had been a little bit silent on some of this, took it up, uh, took up the issue of resilience. <coughs> but in many ways, the visions that we see right now, even some by the same designers, are much more tamped down in, in exuberance than they were before. So these visions are not inherently reactionary or harmful. But to me, in their processes, they too often acquiesce to dominant political economic structures, even while proposing dramatic changes to social and spatial relationships. Consider anthropologist James Holston's critique of modernist planning. For Holston, plans such as Costa's Brasilia here and Ludwig Hilversheimer's for Berlin attempt to impose alternative futures embodied in the plans without accounting for the social realities of the present and how they must change for these futures to be attainable. Says Holston, quote, modernist planning does not admit or develop productively the paradoxes of its imagined future. Instead, it attempts to plan without contradiction, without conflict, end quote. So the propositions I show here are not precisely the modernist visions that Holston critiques. They imagine dramatic changes to both social and spatial relationships. And in each of these cases, the plan makes a big gesture, sometimes literally a big gesture, uh, towards place-based and locally defined contexts. In the case of Rebuild by Design, they explicitly make political engagement a core part of the process. And in Jakarta, the giant seawall evokes the region's cultural history. And yet, they don't productively develop the pathways through which new relationships are attained. In too many circumstances, they propose these dramatic changes with no corresponding change in political and economic structures. In other circumstances, they propose idealized structures in ways that are really unsupported on the ground when you really start talking to people about what the problems are. So while they attempt to appeal to local cultural, culture and communities, they do not explain the social and political and environmental ways to get there from here. The year following the IPCC's report, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC's report warning about the implications of not keeping warming within 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, we have witnessed a surge of mobilization, propositions, and media coverage around climate change. This included, notably, a pitch youth climate justice movement, exemplified by the actions of the Sunrise Movement in the US and Swedish teenager Greta Thunberg's climate strike which began as a solo action in September 2018 and reached a kind of crescendo a year later with Thunberg crossing the Atlantic Ocean in a zero emissions yacht to attend the UN Climate Summit and a global climate strike on September 20, 2019, involving hundreds and thousands of people across all continents. The prominent call during this climate strike was for climate justice. 
Climate change is often considered a generalized process affecting everyone everywhere. But while the factors of climate change, its historical and present day causes, its biophysical, biochemical, and atmospheric conditions may well be considered generalized, we know that climate impacts are neither evenly distributed nor are vulnerabilities equally shared. The people least responsible for, climate for greenhouse gas emissions, and now I'm basically reciting something that every climate researcher should know. The people least responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, particularly poor, marginalized people in less industrialized countries, primarily in the global south, will suffer first and most from the impacts of climate change. The responsibility for, vulnerability to, and ability to act against climate change are unequally borne, caused, and maintained by historical and present day inequities. In fact, climate change intrinsically links global general processes and particular historical impacts and actions. And I think the emerging global social movement that is responding to this uh, gives us a lot of ways to think about how we, through our own fields, might engage these issues. The climate justice movement emphasizes climate change as an issue of human rights, ethics, and equity. It arose on the actions of people fighting for their lives and livelihoods amid a set of global conditions and constraints including farmers and fisher people in the global south who rallied against continued inaction uh, during the global climate summits. It emerged in conjunction with a set of global transnational people's movements, including the anti-globalization activism of the late 1990s and growing indigenous rights movements around the world. Global south activists and international environmental and corporate watch groups formed the International Climate Justice Network and developed the Bali Principles of Climate Justice at, uh, in, in 2002. Climate justice coalesced as a global movement in the lead up to COP15 in Copenhagen in, in 2009 and has arguably attained another level of cohesion with the youth movement now. Climate justice builds on a history of environmental justice, activism, and scholarship, but they dislocate, the movement as well dislocates the core discourses of the EJ movement. Climate justice necessarily extends previously largely place-based and locally experienced concerns to broader and longer spatial and temporal, temporal scales, and more diffuse and simultaneously more generalized and particular, particularized levels of experience and knowledge. So the climate justice movement builds on these place-based and community-oriented struggles, but it also appeals to notions of global inequities and disparate vulnerabilities that are spatially multiscalar and temporarily extended across global south and north, among specific communities and sites, historical to the present. So activists and scholars cite concepts such as ecological debt, that is the historical and ongoing unequal exploitative relationships between richer, more industrialized countries and poorer, less industrialized ones, and the necessity for a just transition. They call for the abandonment of fossil fuels, the rejection of purely market-based and technical solutions, and they, and they demand compensation for climate debt. So they want system change, not climate change. Furthermore, its emergence as a global movement is dependent on organizing around the multi-scalar, multi-level multi frameworks such as the multilateral climate fora and through transnational workers and indigenous rights networks and coalitions. So they take up, this movement takes up concerns of dispar disparate harms in ways that are parallel to previous environmental justice struggles, 
but reframed to the specific conditions of climate change and new global and local institutions. The movement responds to the condition of climate change, its causes and impacts, but it as well reflects the reconfigured political and institutional spaces of a climate changing world. So the climate changing world itself creates the institutions through which climate justice activists are able to bring their concerns and develop a coalition across, across the world. And so in many ways, in my view, the emerging movement epitomizes the opportunities and challenges of globalized techno technology permeated societies in which very particular injustices often exacerbated by globalization are made knowable and broadly actionable through generalized and globalized flows of information. We can dwell on that more. I know that whole thing was like a lot of writing. I find this particularly in interesting, this, particu this condition in this moment. But these dynamics of climate justice have yet to significantly impact urban theory, planning theory, or urban design theory and practice. How might urban design respond to the climate justice movement? So recall some of the initial observations I made when I, when, when I uh, started the talk about the global urban networks uh, through which environmental plans are now formed and the spatial, ecological, and social and political factors uh, around urban ecological problems, those two aspects. So it's clear to me that design processes also planning processes, are inherently embedded in globalized and generalized systems of knowledge and production. And that the projects we all work on take place across the terrain of conflicts and struggles uh, of those fighting for their rights and recognition of historically unjust ecological processes. The, so restated, the processes of planning and design are deeply intertwined within the processes through which the climate justice movement emerges. But they're the processes that historically urban designers have concerned themselves with the least. So for me, design for urban climate justice would first address the generalized and particularized causes and impacts of climate change, finding innovative uh, approaches to radically reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and to protect against climate impacts. And I think many designers are actually doing this part. And second, to do this in recognition of the historically specific social and spatial injustices that have been so much part of causing the climate crisis, and the claims and agency of those who have been affected. Designers are very good at translating information, environment to systems to form. So how do we tune this to engage more deeply with the multi-scalar, multi-level processes and interconnections that inform the ways that sustained change is made? I've talked in the past, and you can uh, find a paper on this, about how theorists and practitioners of uh, ecological urbanism or landscape urbanism have exploited the interplay of what might be considered built and natural and contested the false dichotomy of city and nature. So they've established that the urban landscape itself transcends the scale of urban governance and politics, the scale of planning projects, and in, in and as well political institutions, always in relation to and ideally uh, in tune with appropriate ecological scales, such as the watershed. And I've called in the past for landscape designers and, and landscape urbanists to, to build on that and to extend the, these frameworks to engage with 
both uh, some of the, the, the more global processes and as well uh, with the local social relationships. And the point that I'll end with today very much reinforces this kind of thinking. I'll, I'll cite two more concepts and then close. So back to Holston. Holston, in claiming that modernist utopian planning did not reconcile societal contradictions, coined the term insurgent citizenship and urged that planners pay attention to, quote, new kinds of practices and narratives about belonging to and participating in society, end quote, outside of formal concepts of nation building and statehood. To do this, he proposed the embracement of ethnographic methods, tracing, decoding, and re-articulating to understand and re-envision the realm of possibilities that might develop from, uh, <coughs> to riff on a, a phrase, actually <coughs> existing social relationships. Manuel Castells, in investigating new urban social movements in a time of pervasive digital networks, speaks of, quote, the space of autonomy, end quote, which is the space of movement uh, as an interaction between the space of flows of digital communications and the space of places of occupied sites and protest actions. So he talks about how we need both together in a hybridized way. We need concrete actions on the ground in space. And we need these generalized virtual networks in order for movements to build. So together, these broad concepts that uh, I would propose are attuned to both place-based and historically determined social relationships on the one hand, and to the spaces of possibilities in reconstituting global, urban, and virtual worlds, on the other hand, offer the terms for new urban design practices and gauge with the issues that I've been laying out. And building off of these conceptual provocations, I think that designers have to embolden their, our conceptual array in order to operate across these scales and levels in responsible ways. So on the, on the one hand, to engage the multitude of social practices on the ground, cognizant of their own situated limitations and, and uh, constraints in how much we can actually understand, and on the other, to build hybridized network design movements in the manner of Castell's space of autonomy. So the two takeaways that I would offer, first, Designers should seriously take seriously political education, including theories of social change, critical world histories, and critical pedagogies, learning how to learn from diverse global sites. So beyond aspects of participation and, and engagement that we, we do talk about a lot, more concerted attention to the places of design within broader organizing movements for social change would enable us to think of new ways to practice, uh, but also help designers to understand better when to, to stop and step back and learn from others. Second, designers should create new forms of collaborative network practices that are globally informed but situated in the local. Designers will not be and need not be experts everywhere. And yet, ideas, as I've shown, uh, hopefully shown in some of this work, uh, do not always emerge from just one place. Uh, and power in relationships and movements, but also in ideas and visions, is constituted across spaces. And also depended on time. So I think, for instance, uh, about the work of people like Kamel Mohammed, who runs Architecture Sans Frontier in Indonesia. It's basically like one or two people. Um, uh, but he, he's, an, he's a designer. He works with a community organizing group called the Urban Poor Consortium uh, to fight against the eviction 
of uh, informal kampong dwellers. And he helped come up with a new prototype to move the, the focus of the kampong away from the river and enable water to more freely flow through it while creating new social spaces around it. And I'm interested in, in, in this, uh, this design practice, not only because of the design itself, which is lovely, uh, but how it responds to environmental and state development pressures while engaging community-based agency and desires. Also, how it reflexively learns from and in turn offers new knowledge to a network of activist groups gathered around several Indonesian cities confronting this, the same kinds of problems, and how it engages a global network of advocates and researchers who are trying to understand urban environmental struggles and new ways to move forward. Uh, like me, like when you go to Indonesia, it's impressive uh, and inspiring how you immediately are drawn into a network of activists, designers, and researchers who know that without a more global reach, the, the actions that they do are circumscribed, are only, well, are mostly uh, effective within the local places and communities they reside in. So these kinds of practices are intriguing and inspiring precisely when they are part of these broader political movements. Uh, and for me, new urban design research uh, approaches can build on them uh, to be both radical and uh, response, both radically and responsibly global and historical and place-based at the same time. So consider then what we uh, might call practices of insurgent landscapes, building on Holston, that situate themselves firmly in what he, Holston, calls the ethno eth excuse me, ethnography of the present while building movements across the global networks that we are all learning to be so accustomed to. Thank you. My question concerns climate change adaptation versus mitigation. Um, some of your measures that, like that last house in Jakarta was easily a really great adaptation. In your you know, kind of planning design, do you see a more effective way between adaptation or mitigation? Because the more research I get on the climate side is people think mitigation is easier, it's less costly, but adaptation is the most effective and it's more costly. Yeah. So just uh, getting your kind of opinion on that would be amazing. Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a good question. So to re restate it, uh, how might we think about the differences between mitigation and adaptation? Um, and so for, for folks who have not looked at the, the climate response scholarship world that much, so mitigation is what we might do to lessen the causes of the impacts that we face. So try as much as we can, let's say in urban planning, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we stop uh, global warming. Adaptation is when we recognize that things are happening and we must respond. So we adapt to, let's say, either sea level rise, which is going on in many places, or to hotter, drier uh, climates, or even to some th other things that may not be directly climate related, like for instance, refu refugees which, who may be moving because of climate change impacts to other places that may not be facing the same kinds of dire, dire circumstances. And there has been historically a tension between, te um, between mitigation and adaptation because initially many scientists who study, or I would say the scientists have been largely um, non-advocates still quite recently, so they've, the, the physical climate scientists, but for social scientists, uh, they've tended to be wary of focusing on adaptation because it may preclude doing the necessary things to, to mitigate climate change. So it's not so much that what's, what, what might be easier, it's that for a long time, 
it was considered like a dirty word in climate research circles if you deliberately focus on adaptation, you were almost like giving up. From, let's say, around 2005 onwards, so the last 12 year, years or so, there's been an increasing surge of attention to adaptation. And this comes from two things. One is that uh, most people now, most uh, researchers now acknowledge that things are already happening. And even if we completely cut uh, the rise of greenhouse gas emissions right now, the, 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 cl the, uh, the planet will continue to grow warmer, and we will have to take adap adaptive actions regardless. So the IPCC acknowledges this. We all know that this is happening. So researchers have begun to focus much more on adaptation as something that has to happen. The other thing, which is very evident, particularly when you start looking at um, some of the global institutions, the lending institutions, the consultants, the um, uh, designers who are involved in this, that adaptation is Uh, it's a right business opportunity. So mitigation, and for those who have studied sustainability for a while, like if you've looked at issues of sustainability, in the beginning, it was always about, oh, do less, live less, don't, don't, like don't do this, use less of that. Do. And I think that was the case for mitigation for a long time. And the, the recognition that we have to do something anyway is an invitation to put resources uh, to addressing this in ways that are oftentimes very um, compliant with urban development protocols that we already have. So if you need investment to a place, if before it, it was about urban renewal, uh, because of so-called slum conditions. Right now, it might be because uh, these poor folks are in harm's way. We better get them out. And you know, here's a new waterfront development in its place that is adapted to climate change. And so the, the tension continues. And I think the, the most interesting work around uh, climate change responses now it, are the ones that actually tease out both the uh, complicity in some ways of the climate action uh, world in uh, oftentimes exclusionary development projects, but also the fact that, you know, we have to, like, actions will be taken one way or the other, and how do we do it with a view towards more uh, just and equitable uh, outcomes? Thank you very much. Sure. Hi, I'm Alex Sarno. I'm uh, MEP, uh, Master of Urban Planning as well as Public Policy. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm very much inspired by the power of identity, and I love that you incorporated that into this presentation. And so I'm curious, where have you seen the, uh, the implementation of identity in public education campaigns uh, most effective, and what elements have contributed to allowing for that aspect of the change that society may need in order yeah. to make some of these um, societal changes actually occur. Does that make sense? Yeah, but can you maybe um, like briefly talk a little bit about what you mean by the power of identity? Sure. So specifically that I'm a big believer that we're not separate from nature. And so in, in I feel like that's an important aspect of making these changes and in, in, in galvanizing public support for <clears throat> individual behavior as well as um, societal agreement on, on what we need to do in, in regards to our behavior changes so and, and, design, and designing um, urban spaces that are more in tune with the processes of nature, et cetera. So how are nature and identity connected for you? Well, we ultimately depend on our, our environment. And so if we're over consuming okay. or if we're uh, contaminating our environment, then we're not. Um, we're not. We're not. Uh, hmm, I'm kind of stuck on it, but essentially, yeah. If if we're over consuming and we're, if we're not considering our environment and its health, then we're essentially directly um, harming oh. ourselves in the process. Okay. 
So that, I think that's a really interesting, the way that you've just framed identity is a really interesting way to even think about the issue because I would say that when most people, and especially after seeing, seeing this, when most people might mention identity, they might be like, oh, well, um, clearly that Garuda project, the giant seawall, was an appeal to a kind of identity, a cultural and national identity on the part of the Indonesians. And uh, for, for those of us who have studied planning, an explicit nod towards the fact that we did not do this sometimes in the past, like we ignored aspects of either community identity, um, ethnic or racial identity, gender, um, gender identity in formulating plans. So, so this kind of uh, work uh, is, in my in in my view, is a sort of maybe maybe could could be better, but it for sure is an, an a deliberate. Uh, de deliberate way to address identity, but how you're framing identity in connection with like the use of or our relationship with nature is much deeper and much in more interesting, I think. Uh, it reminds me a bit about uh, you know, the, the Neil Smith, the geographer Neil Smith, uh, who cons he wrote very interesting things about the production of nature uh, quite some years ago, where he talked about the transformation in nature in the world in terms that were very much connected with the transformation of society. And for him, the societal transformation that was most key was that of uh, capitalism. Uh, increasingly globalized capitalism. So, and he has this beautiful, super dense chapter that I make my students read every year. And when I make them read, I have to read it over again because it's so dense. Where he talks about the transformation of, of, of our meaning of oursel ourselves in connection with the transformation with nature as part of these broader political and economic forces. And he didn't talk about climate change per se, but when it's not hard to extend that and to say that that global transformation of nature that you're talking about is the underlying root cause of climate change. So the, the climate challenges that we face right now can be traced very directly to, to our changing me like meaning of ourselves as, as people who may have been more connected with nature, f whose labor may have been more in touch with the transforming of things that we may consider natural, to now where, uh, and this is Neil Smith's point, where most of us are completely dislocated in our lives from the transformation of anything that may, may be considered like natural. Um, so that's a long-winded way of saying like, I think that's very, very interesting. Some of the <laughs> so some of the interesting emerging <coughs> ideas uh, that I've been looking at. So and th this is not not it hasn't been in my research to date, but 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 I'm getting into more. It's about how um, particular um, identity movements are moving and pushing aspects of uh, here like climate justice beyond identity per se. So if you talk about like indigenous claims to particular lands, right, that has always been an environmental issue, that's always been a political issue. But now you see more and more indigenous rights movements growing and building as a, uh, as part of a global uh, environmental justice movement. It's like a switch from saying like, well, we belong here and this is ours, to a much more collective uh, and broadly constituted movement where indigenous rights movements are very much in tune with anti-globalization movements. And I think you get then, an, for me, an interesting um, collapsing of researchers like the kind of like hardcore Marxist political economic researchers who are considered a, cons, concerned about like globalized capitalism and folks who are saying don't 
ignore identity, don't ignore historical difference and what that might mean uh, for marginalized groups who are fighting for change in the same, in the same arenas. Hi, um, my name is Buddy. I'm a first year in the Masters in Urban Planning program. Um, when you were talking about the Big U project, the thing that stuck out to me was, um, and studying environmental planning in particular seems to be a common theme, is that there are these big, innovative, exciting design ideas that uh, we can conceptually wrap our heads around from a planning and design perspective. But then it comes to things like implementing those ideas and particularly funding that's where things shut down and we have to make decisions between d does like one part of downtown get the project but other parts that are historically excluded from those processes don't. So like when it comes to innovating and in design particularly around climate change, do you see or like what do you imagine it would look like to innovate in the funding and sort of like more financial aspect of design as well so like we could maybe stop having to make those difficult choices where people get excluded? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I think um, we confront it more and more now when, here I have a final slide which may be appropriate. Like we confront it more and more now when we're starting to think about like movements like the Sunrise Movements and others who are starting to acknowledge that it is not enough to say like come up with the the great plan that will then have problems because our pro our um, scales of govern government our institutions of both like uh, political institutions and social institutions and our main modes of funding are inadequate to 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 do what we want to get done so in my book which is nice to be able to say in my book <laughs> Uh, I talk about how for the Rebuild by Design pr projects, they, kn they knew this. And one of the continual contradictions that they, 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 bo they, they had to bear was um, wanting to do this, these kinds of Dutch-style, multi-scalar regional protections that you see in, in like the Netherlands is like way smaller than, than so many of the conditions that we see elsewhere. But the, the aspirations for these multi-scalar comprehensive plans um, with the, the full recognition that they didn't have the protocols to get that kind of work done. So there were some really innovative, and, and I would say, I would be the first to say, really innovative ways that they were even able to do this project, which was to use, um, which was to have the Rockefeller Foundation, a private, non like a, a private nonprofit <laughs> funder, pay for the competition phase and fund, largely fund the organization itself which was then housed in an academic unit, this NYU um, uh, Institute for Public Knowledge, with then the promise of federal funds through community development block grants. So they actually rigged a really interesting way to try to get it implemented in a context where no, no kind of federal climate uh, spatial planning had ever been done. Like we just don't do it in this country. They found a way to come up with um, a competition for regional plans with some promise of government funding. But what that did was it constrained the localities later because these CB, uh, CDBG funds are meant to be primarily locally or municipal, municipally uh, coordinated for usually for mar like low income communities. So it was. Um, an innovative, ambitious way to think precisely about the issue that you brought up, funding, and constraints, because it, was, it could not be fully implemented. Most of the projects were awarded a fraction of what it would ultimately take. I think the Big U was, av was awarded something like $335 million for a project that even in a smaller, like a less ambitious form, will cost somewhere like $1.5 and the point was then was that 
private, that private urban development would take up the rest, was that you could then have New York does what these days it does best, which is to leverage private funds towards building the public infrastructure that the city uh, tends not to want to do anymore. So folks like the Sunrise Movement and other advocates of the Green New Deal are saying like we have to do it in a different way. So the appeal to the New Deal, the FDR era New Deal, is to say that at one time in this country's history, facing parallel, if not like even like not quite as bad global challenges, we came up with ways for the federal government to create from the federal government down, create ways to, to, uh, to really transform how we, how we use space, how we think about electricity, how we think about transportation, how we think about housing. And so I'm very much like um, a proponent of this. I think that we do need to think about better ways um, of financing, better ways of, of, of um, governance and implementation. I think what is missing, and this is, um, this has been, uh, you know, made as a critique of the Green New Deal as well. That the the ideas and the and and the institutions, the ideas about institutions, are not quite there yet to have uh, projects uh, and a large scale initiative such as this be translated into the sites and the scales that we need in order to um, rebuild the infrastructure in our urban regions or to um, bolster housing. There was a bill last week uh, by Bernie Sanders and AOC that was specifically about public uh, funding for public housing. So there are initial steps. But I think that planners need to take a firmer grasp on this and, and acknowledge that, you know, in some ways, practicing planners have started to take a step back from large scale change. Um, both because we did it so badly in the 1960s sometimes, but also because um, of habit and, and structural forces. We've become used to uh, urban governance, uh, governments not being able to do stuff. And uh, given the option, we would rather have, I'm saying we as like the proverb, proverbial city out there, we would rather have a big private company situate itself, like an Amazon or something, or a Citibank, situate itself in the city in, in exchange for like a decade of tax breaks, um, just to have those jobs, not to say that those jobs are not important, but to have those jobs at the expense of cities being able to have uh, the, the funds that they used to a long time ago to actually take action on some of these things. One more note, a lot of folks, um, and, I'm, and I've been a little bit part of these discussions, have been also trying to think of new ideas about regional planning. Like how do we take regional planning, which has been historically a planning concern, uh, to be more attuned to, to climate change issues. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you for it. Um, My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.